Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be telling up some Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit... Or, you know, the ghost next door. Before picking up the book this week, I didn't remember anything about this one, like, at all. It was a really solid one, too. Even if the twist was somewhat predictable, in my opinion, if you haven't read this one, you might want to check it out before watching the video. It was the most earnest ending so far, and it's definitely worth reading. When looking at the original cover, I think a big reason I never read this one is because it's a pretty boring cover. I'm sorry, but it is. I also think it has an unpleasant color combo going on, so if I was at the library and I saw this among my options, I was probably consistently going after more exciting looking book covers. Plus, ghosts have just never really scared me. Although, this is a lesson in don't judge a book by its cover, because I think this was an above average Goosebumps book. The 2003 version improves the color combo slightly, but not enough to save it. I should say though, this is our first instance of the red converse being front and center. These red converse pop up frequently in Jacobus's work. Anytime I read the word sneakers, I still picture these red converse, so there has to be some sort of like formative correlation going on there. The 2015 version is a solid improvement. This isn't something I say often about the newer covers, but I really like what they added to this to make it a little bit creepier. I like that we have a goblin looking door knocker and a hand that looks like it's ready to like that horror movie fingernail scrape thing. Definitely an overall improvement in my opinion. As far as merchandise goes, once again there's less than there should be. It's a great story, but I do kind of understand because it lacks some of the iconic imagery to stick on things. Maybe if the cover had focused on the shadow creature that terrorized Hannah, there'd be more to work with. Instead we just got the usual trading cards and it's somewhat featured on some window stickers. So I guess there's that. Our front tag says, there's a strange new kid on the block, which is of course a reference to new kids on the block because it's the early 90s after all. The back tag says, how come I've never seen you before? I've read that this is the only Goosebumps tag to feature a direct quote from the story, so that's something. Before we get into the summary, let's read the blurb on the back. Hannah's neighborhood has just gotten a little weird, ever since that new boy moved in next door. But when did he move in? Wasn't the house empty when Hannah went to sleep the night before? Why does it still look so deserted? She's not getting any answers from her new neighbor. He just keeps disappearing in the oddest ways. And he's so pale. Is Hannah being haunted by the ghost next door? Okay, now that that's done, let's start our summary. This story opens with a bang. We meet Hannah Fairchild and her room is on fu fire. She's watching horrified as her bedroom burns all around her, realizing it's too late to scream, but she screamed anyways. This is of course a dream sequence, but it definitely hooks you right in. That morning after the nightmare, Hannah reflects on the state of her life we learn that it's summer, she's losing track of the days due to extreme boredom, and she's feeling extra lonely since all of her friends seem to have left for family vacations or camp. Despite this, she's just happy not to be on fire this morning. She throws on a pair of day glow green shorts and a neon orange tank top because she is all about the 90s neon and starts her day. She heads downstairs and we meet our set of annoying twin brothers, Bill and Herb. With a name like Herb, you can only expect great things from this child. Mrs. Fairchild is cooking breakfast and rejects a hug from her daughter because she's too busy messing with the eggs. Mrs. Fairchild also threatens to force feed the twins a rubber ball if it gets near her eggs. This mom sounds ready to throw down at a moment's notice. Hannah is a chipper little thing and ignores the family chaos and seems determined to have a good day despite starting off with an intense nightmare. Hannah decides to go for a morning bike ride and as she's walking outside she suddenly gets mowed down in a chapter cliffhanger by a boy on a bike. He claims he didn't see her and Hannah raises a very valid point that she's not hard to miss in her neon ensemble. We learn that this boy is her new neighbor Danny Anderson this perplexes Hannah though because she never saw the boy move in and she's been home a lot in the backyard this summer, so she thinks he would have to move in in the middle of the night for her to not notice. He seems equally skeptical of her though for some reason. These are just two very suspicious children. This awkward exchange is brought to a halt though because Herb stole Bill's Game Boy and is shouting about it, and the time it takes her to turn around and yell at Bill, Danny seemingly just vanishes into thin air, which sounds pretty ghostly to me. We skip to later in the afternoon and Hannah is so supremely bored that she is eagerly waiting for the mail to arrive like just sitting there staring at the mailbox because her friends at camp were supposed to write to her but haven't. She doesn't get any mail so she sits down and writes an angry letter to her friend letting her know that she hopes she isn't having too much fun because Dear Janie, I hope you're having a good time at camp, but not too good because you broke your promise. You said you'd write to me every day and so far I haven't received a crummy postcard. I'm so bored I don't know what to do. You can't imagine how little there is to do in Greenwood Falls when no one is around. It's really like death. So I'm just going to say this now, I think Hannah is the dead one. This line about it being death was just a little too on the nose for me. I'm so primed for twists now that I don't trust this title and the opening with Hannah burning to death in her room is oddly specific. 
Plus, this Danny boy crashing his bike into her because he didn't see her, and she started a campfire the night before in her backyard, I'm on to you, Stein. Maybe this will be like Twist Inception, though, and I'm supposed to realize that she's an actual ghost early on, and we'll get a second twist. Or maybe I'm just completely wrong. We'll find out shortly. And if I am right, I'm not going to hold it against this story, because this is a children's book after all. Can't really gloat about solving the plot twist in a book aimed at the elementary levels. Hannah finishes her letter and decides to walk to the post office because she doesn't have anything better to do at this point. As she's walking, she greets a neighbor, who ignores her. Add that to the ghost evidence list. While dropping off her mail, she hears some commotion and finds the postmaster yelling at Danny and two other boys, Fred and Alan. This postmaster is a fu- prick though, and was throwing rocks at their dog to get them off of government property. Hannah reveals that this man hates kids and is always chasing them off. I can't imagine the post office being THE place to be, so I don't know how often he does this. Hannah also casually mentions how for Halloween one year, she and a group of kids were going to go do some light mischief and, you know, just spray paint his windows, but this was thwarted by him sitting on the porch with a shotgun. All of these people are taking things just a little too far. In Ghost Evidence Exhibit 6, the postmaster walks right by her without acknowledging her also, but she thinks it's just because he's an angry asshole. Hannah loses track of everyone and decides to go home and watch General Hospital because she's just that bored. I felt this in my soul because one summer in 6th grade I was so bored and without cable that I found myself regularly watching the soap opera Passions. If you're unfamiliar with Passions, you are missing out because that was some of the wildest television I've watched to this day. The first episode I ever stumbled across had a pregnant lady being held captive in a pit being guarded by an evil clown. The evil clown also was just another main character who wanted to steal the pregnant lady's baby because she was faking a pregnancy of her own to steal the pregnant woman's man. It also had an orangutan named Precious who was a nurse who was in love with a man named Luis and he used to have these like dream sequences where he would feed her things like strawberries and stuff. Oh, and the show also had a witch that did actual magic. And every December, the witch's sister would escape from the insane asylum dressed as Santa and would chase the various cast members around with an ax. I could seriously talk about passions all day. We're talking storylines involving tsunamis, incest, and even a hermaphroditic serial killer, which would not fly today. It had everything you could want at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. If I ever get a hold of all the episodes, maybe I'll make videos about that someday. back to Hannah. As Hannah is heading home to watch her stories, she realizes some creepy figure in all black seems to be following her and whispering her name. At one point she says, the dry whisper, dry as death. So I'm considering this ghost clue number seven, and I think it's just a form of death trying to drop a hint that it's time to go. When she turns around to confront this mysterious black figure, it's gone. She tries to tell her family about the new neighbors, and no one seems to care. So she goes up to her room and longingly looks at Danny's house and wonders if he's really in there. We get ghost hint number 8, and Hannah remarks that the days keep floating by and she has no sense of time because she doesn't get to interact with anybody really. She finally spots Danny in his backyard one afternoon and goes to chat with him. He's standoffish at first, but they bond over what an ass the postmaster is. He reveals that the two other guys were friends from school in ghost clue number 9 because Hannah doesn't get how he already has friends if he just moved here and it's summer. It's almost like time is passing by Hannah. This gets even more complicated because they come to find out that they're in the same grade at the same school but don't seem to know any of the same kids. Danny's tennis ball is on the roof so he climbs up with a ladder. This suddenly really freaks Hannah out and she wants him to come down now. He's busy showing off and in a chapter cliffhanger he tumbles head first right off the roof. Hannah opens her eyes and realizes he's not laying there dead with a broken neck like she anticipated. Instead he's standing there grinning and she wonders how he landed without making a sound. Maybe they're both ghosts. That'll be cute. Two little platonic ghost buddies hanging out and haunting the neighborhood. After an afternoon of watching her brothers, Hannah starts a ghost clue count of her own against Danny. She reflects on how he just keeps vanishing, the lack of mutual friends, how she never sees anyone enter or leave the house. She concludes that the only reasonable thing to do now is some spying. She creeps up to the kitchen window and gets a shock as Danny is looking right back at her, so her spying is not off to a great start. She needs to get some tips from Lucy. Danny immediately gets that she was spying on him and offers to let her join the family for dinner, but she's too mortified from getting caught and awkwardly leaves. Hannah is committed to spying though, because the next day she decides to stalk Danny into town. However, she continues to be a terrible spy and loses track of him almost immediately. As she looks for him, she's suddenly chased by the mysterious black figure again. 
This time it almost gets her with a creepy black bone arm, and she notices that it has red glowing eyes. She takes a tumble on her bike, and in a chapter cliffhanger, we think she's got got, but suddenly Danny appears. He states that he only saw Hannah and not the mysterious black figure, so that's minus one for my Danny is a ghost too theory. He's rightfully very concerned that Hannah might have a head injury, but we kinda just leave the scene and cut to Hannah waiting for the mail like the day before. This poor girl is lonesome. Hannah passes the time by writing another threatening letter to her friend who continues to ignore her at camp. The acts of violence include hoping that the girl fell into a lake and drowned, to having been bitten by a snake and swelled up so bad that she can't write. Hannah also lists her reasons for Danny being a ghost, and suddenly she notices Danny's in the tree above her. In a chapter cliffhanger, Danny insists that Hannah can't mail that letter because she's discovered the truth about him. This excitement is short-lived though because we quickly realize that this is yet another dream sequence. Hannah wakes up and finds her twin brothers in her face taunting her about snoring. She picks up the letter and reassures herself that sometimes dreams reveal the truth, and she's even more determined to continue spying on Danny. Her spying becomes more of a direct investigation though, because she decides to invite Danny out for ice cream to chat with him. In Girl, You're a Ghost moment number 10, she's confused as to why Danny's mom won't answer the door despite Hannah pounding on it. It's almost like Danny's mom can't see or hear Hannah. Hmm. Anna plays the reverse card though, and decides that Danny's mom is also a ghost. She returns home and blurts out that the family next door are a bunch of ghosts, and her family appears unfazed and doesn't really take it this seriously. They just kind of assume she's making up stories. Hannah decides to soothe her nerves over some ice cream and heads up to town without Danny. She keeps wandering off alone, even though she's periodically being chased by some evil shadow creature with red glowing eyes. I think ice cream could wait until like daylight or at least when I had company. In Girl You're a Ghost numbers 11, 12, and 13, Hannah reaches the ice cream parlor and starts feeling really weird when she tries to enter the building. Suddenly, Danny and the two other boys come racing out and Hannah is knocked to the ground as Mr. Harder runs past her. Or should I say through her? On top of that, Mr. Harder doesn't even acknowledge that he ran her ass over and he just storms back inside to the ice cream shop. Hannah just thinks he's really irritated at the situation, but Hannah is a very forgiving character and just justifies all these people constantly ignoring her and running into her. Hannah forgets about her ice cream desires and tries to catch up with Danny and the boys. She eventually finds them celebrating their ice cream theft. The boys don't seem to notice her, and as she's getting ready to engage further, suddenly cop lights appear and catch her little crooks. Actually, no, it's just regular car lights and the man is asking for directions. Hannah continues to hide in the bushes watching Danny. Danny is getting some classic after school special peer pressuring and being dared to steal the mailbox. Just say no, Danny. Hannah decides to intervene, but when she goes to shout at the boys, Ghost Clue 14 happens and suddenly everything goes black and two red glowing eyes appear right in front of her in a chapter cliffhanger. This time, the red eyes kind of just vanish and we're right back where we started with the three boys attempting to steal this mailbox. Hannah retreats to her bush and at one point tries to shout at Danny to stop being a pushover, but he doesn't hear her. As the three boys are yanking on the mailbox, the postmaster comes out and gets a hold of Danny. They end up damaging his mailbox, but get away. He lets them know his shotgun will remember them next time. The boys reflect on their escape, and Hannah has really seemed to step up her spying skills because they don't notice her at all. Or you know, she's a ghost. These boys are kind of a bunch of punks though, because they are really enjoying the destruction that they've caused, and they need to brush up on their stand your ground laws because they don't think they'll really get shot. That's something you don't really want to find out the hard way. I would actually love if all these kids were ghosts. Danny dying from falling off the roof, and then these two other boys being the victims of shotgun blasts from the overzealous postmaster, that would be a fun twist in my mind. On Danny's walk home, Hannah decides to confront him on what a little terror he's being. He insists that the boys are just all talk and they're not so bad. You are the company you keep, Danny. Hannah goes into her real line of questioning and wants to know why his mom ignored her while she was beating on the back door. Turns out she's deaf, and that's why she didn't acknowledge Hannah's pounding. Well, that's very convenient, Stein. Stein also reveals more of his confusion on lip reading and says that the mom is self-conscious about being deaf and fools people by being a really good lip reader. I'm sorry, but it just doesn't work that way. As Hannah is entering the back door to her house, this shadowy figure appears again and begins telling her to stay away from Danny. You know, she's been very focused on figuring out if Danny is a ghost, but not spending nearly enough time wondering what the hell this thing is that keeps following her around. I'm pretty sure that would be my top priority. As the figure gets closer, her dad opens the door and it vanishes, of course. Hannah tells them about the figure in the backyard and they take it a little bit more seriously and actually investigate the yard and contemplate calling the police. As Hannah heads up to her bedroom, she suddenly sees the figure by her bed, but in a chapter cliffhanger fake out, it ends up just being her sweater hanging from the bedpost. In response to this, Hannah exclaims, what a night, and falls asleep wondering about Danny. She also even contemplates if the two other boys are ghosts too. So maybe we're on to our way to like ghost galore in the story. 
She has a dream about the shadowy figure, except this time, under the hood, she sees Danny's face with glowing red eyes. The next morning, she takes a very proactive approach, a la Welcome to Dead House, and asks him, Hey Danny, are you a ghost? This throws him off a bit, but he doesn't really give a straight answer, and Hannah drops the subject. Danny reveals that they're going to get revenge on the postmaster again tonight, which Hannah is very against. As the two kids chat and kick a ball around, Danny trips, and when Hannah goes to help him up, their hands go right through each other. Hannah is immediately like, you're a ghost. And Danny is like, nope, you are, and sticks his hand right through her chest to her surprise. I'm glad Hannah is finding this out now, and not on the last page of the book. It makes it more interesting. Really, this whole book has been pretty interesting, even though the twist wasn't the most subtle. That being said, we still got chapters to go, so there's bound to be another. We get the full backstory revealed when her neighbor, Mrs. Quitley, just happens to be showing Hannah's house off to a friend. We learn that the house burned down five years ago, killing Hannah and her entire family, and that a new house had been built in its place, but remains vacant as of now. We also learn that the fire did in fact start from that campfire, because Hannah did not heed Smokey's warnings and didn't properly put out her campfire. Only you can prevent fire. And it's true, we know we can count on you to do what Smokey says. Drown your campfires with water. Make sure it's totally wet, then stir and drown again. We know we can count on you to do what Smokey says. Only you can prevent forest fires. This book is taking a bit of a sad turn, because now that Hannah knows that she's dead, she races inside to tell her family, only to realize they're all gone. On top of all that, the house is now bare, and Hannah sobs to herself as she has no one to talk to and is all alone. She falls asleep on the empty floor, and when she wakes up, she spots Danny and runs out to talk to him. He is of course terrified and takes off on his bike, presumably to go harass the postmaster some more. Hannah decides this is a priority, because she feels like something bad is going to happen, and she follows Danny via a possible ghost bike. She finds the boy successfully destroying the mailbox, and also notes a strange shadow, but for some reason, doesn't immediately think it's the same frickin' shadow that's been tormenting her this entire story. The boys aren't satisfied with their mailbox destruction, and Hannah realizes that they have a box of matches. The boys then open a window and crawl into the house. Hannah goes up to stop them, and in an unnecessary chapter cliffhanger, something has her leg. It's a garden hose. Stein, now is not the time for trick cliffhangers. I'm actually wanting to see what's happening inside this house. It sounds like arson. And indeed it is. These boys are moved from petty theft, vandalism, and right onto arson because they've set this man's house on fire. Was he a dick? Yes. But does he deserve to have his house burned down? Debatable. Hannah tries to go help Danny when a shadowy figure appears again and tells her to leave Danny alone. And we get yet another chapter cliffhanger where this shadow is reaching for her. This is seriously like the third exact same scenario. It better have some payoff this time. Nope, it just vanishes again. Okay, so this has been a pretty solid story, but maybe Stein was just trying to hit a page quota. I can forgive him. The other two boys come plopping out of the window and it's revealed that Danny is trapped in the fire and can't get out. Hannah once again tries to get in the window only for the shadow figure to appear again and tells her to leave Danny alone. Thankfully, Hannah switches it up this time and is like, no, out of my way and she goes to move the figure and is shocked by how solid it is. She pulls on its face, and then it's revealed that Danny's face is underneath it in another chapter cliffhanger. Shit gets weird, and it's not Danny, but Danny's ghost. The ghost declares that when Danny dies, the ghost will take his place, and Danny will be sent to the Shadow World instead. This is a new variation on ghost lore that I haven't encountered yet. Does this mean that Hannah has an evil ghost running around too? I'm not going to think about it too much. Hannah decides to bust right through this evil-ass ghost to save Danny. She makes it in the house and finds him surrounded by flames. She realizes she can do things that regular humans can't and yanks him right out of the burning house. Once in the grass, Danny smiles at Hannah, says thanks, and then everything goes black for Hannah. We cut to Danny's bedroom, where it's revealed that he was treated for minor burns and smoke inhalation by the paramedics, and then dropped off at his house. Can they do that without going to the hospital? He insists that Hannah saved him, but Miss Quitley, who is also here for some reason, says no that Hannah died in a fire five years ago. Hannah is watching this go down from the doorway and reflecting on how maybe this is her reason her family and her were returned after five years, to save Danny from burning to death too. Also, can we stop this tender moment and just point out that these little bastards set this man's house on fire and no one is really acknowledging it? Like, I'd be thankful to be alive, but my mother would make sure that I wasn't if I had just committed arson. Hannah hears her mother's voice telling her it's time to come back. She floats away as everything fades to gray and she tells Danny to remember her while she wipes a tear away. And that's it. I think this is a pretty solid ending, and easily the most emotional one we've encountered so far. 
I'm not crying, you're crying. I have zero memory of this episode, and I'm surprised to see that it's a two-parter because, although I like the story, it doesn't really seem like it needs 40 minutes to be told. When looking for interesting actors, the main kids didn't really go on to do much, but Neil Crone, who played the Postmaster, Dov Tyvenbach, who played Fred, and Salvador Antonio, who was the pizza guy, who have all gone on to do like a ton of movies and TVs, including Jason X, It Chapter 1 and 2, Cube 2, The Umbrella Academy, Schitt's Creek, and much more. Of course, also including the Magic School Bus. The episode delivers on its fire nightmare opening, but it could have used some flames. I love how massive this laptop is. Well, it's hot out. There's not supposed to be much water, but my dad keeps on watering the lawn anyway. Well, I guess that's the most exciting thing happening around here. The Shadow Man shows up much earlier. Mom! Hannah doesn't play around and calls 911 immediately, and there's a nice little hint that she's a ghost. I don't know what it is, but it's sneaking around outside the house next door. Hello, this is 911. Do you have an emergency? Hello? Hello, 911. Do you have an emergency? Yes, I have an emergency. I just told you. Aren't you listening to me? Hello? You have to love this day to night filter and that her response is to run outside towards the danger. Hannah, I had high hopes for you, girl. Danny is a magician. Guess we caught you when you weren't looking. Where'd it go? Special delivery. Danny almost becomes roadkill in this one. It's... No. Danny! Look out! <laughs> the shadow on the ground is a little confusing. See you around. That's weird. Huh? This episode is having to diverge quite a bit from the books just to fit in some scares. Huh. Okay. Joke's over. Come on out. Anna. Danny? Danny? The internet used to be so much simpler. House fire on Cordina claims family? I like that in hindsight, we'll learn that this house is just dirty and not haunted. Wait a second. I enjoy this apology. I was just gonna say I'm sorry. I should have told you about my mom and why I don't let people in the house. Okay, it's your turn. What were you going to say? Oh, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry I thought you were a ghost. I'm surprised they revealed that Hannah is a ghost in part one. I love the garlic defense. Danny, why are you acting like this? Stay back, okay? Just stay away from us! Garlic, what do you think I am? A vampire? This training to be a ghost stuff is just reinforcing my thoughts that this could have been one episode. Yes! Danny almost gets squished. Are you alright? 
right? Okay, finally something scary. Why do you want to hurt Danny? You wanted to know why he alone can see you. Hannah. So there really were bikes being ridden by ghosts. I figured she just had an especial imaginary ghost bike this whole time. Hey, what? <laughs> Me to Danny in this scene. Rescues him via piano. You hear that? There's someone inside. <coughs> Hello? <coughs> Anybody? <coughs> oh, oh no. <coughs> Come on. <coughs> The ending is at least the same, and yes, no one seems to care that this boy committed arson. You lose! No! Hannah? Hannah? You've done a good job, honey. It's time to come home. Goodbye, Danny. Thank you, Hannah. Overall, I thought The Ghost Next Door was great. It had a much different vibe than the other Goosebumps books so far. It's a pretty melancholy story with a pleasant but lonely protagonist, which makes it even more sad when we find out that Hannah and her entire family burned to death because of her campfire. Some of the shadow Danny stuff feels forced in hindsight, and it doesn't really hold up when you give it too much thought, but I don't think it hurts the story enough to warrant actual criticism. I'll give this one 5 out of 5 Smokey the Bears. This was a nice change of pace. Now onto our Goosebumps totals. For The Ghost Next Door, we didn't have any asshole victims, it's a prank bros, or shoulder scares to add to our account, but we did have a couple it's only a dream moments. I found two it's only a dream fakeouts, the first of course being the first page of the book with the fire nightmare that turns out in the end to be more of an actual memory, the second when Hannah dreams that Danny confesses to being a ghost. There's a third dream in the story, but we know it's a dream and it's not a fakeout, so I'm not counting it. This brings our series total to four. Getting Jiggy with the 90s had a handful of great moments, my favorites being the Dayglow fashion, but we also had three others including Game Boys, Cartoon Tapes, and Watching General Hospital, which was having a bit of a comeback in the 90s. This brings our series total to 57 Jiggy 90s moments. Vomit count remains at zero, without anything even remotely resembling a reference, so that's really interesting and very cool. The Ghost Next Door had a total of 12 chapter cliffhangers. This book had pretty decent cliffhangers though, but I did find myself getting annoyed at the shadow reaching towards Hannah cliffhangers, with nothing really interesting happening. This raises our Goosebumps total to 127. The Clunky Cliffhanger Award for this book goes to chapters 16 to 17, where she thinks the shadow figure is in her room, but it just ends up being her sweater on a bedpost. Unnecessary. The Garden Hose Leg Grab though was a close second. Shocker ending. There's a substantial twist to this story, with Hannah being an actual ghost next door, but that's not at the end of the story. Instead, the book ends on an emotional but happy note, with Hannah crossing back over to be with her family, having successfully saved Danny. So this keeps our total at seven. Well, that's it for The Ghost Next Door. I really enjoyed this one, and I probably would have liked it even more if I read it when I was younger. I bet the twist would have gotten past me back then. Be sure to let me know what you thought of The Ghost Next Door in the comments. Did the twist get you? Do you fully grasp the world building that took place with there being evil shadow people to replace us when we die? Would you burn down your local postmaster's house? Also, what did you think of my ghostly clips? It's mostly just rose red, but that show needs some love. Anyways, thanks again for watching, and make sure you subscribe for... The pride, the love.